Hello and welcome from us. Coming up a little later today, we'll be looking at the government pledge to demolish so-called sink estates in the capital and ask what will appear in their place. Joining me for the duration this week, Neil Coyle, Labour MP for Bermondsey and Old Southwark, and Matthew Offord, Conservative MP for Hendon. Welcome Hi. to you both. I, I want to have a quick word about the terror threat and the Met Commissioner's announcement this week of uh, 600 extra armed officers. Effectively, we're led to believe doubling the armed response vehicle uh, capability. Uh, and presumably you're both going to welcome it, but there's still some uncertainty about where the money's going to come from, Neil? Yeah, it, it is very welcome. And, and the constituency I represent, Birmingham and Old there are the Council Services Unit at the Met have told me there are very specific targets within my constituency. So anything that increases the safety for my constituents is, of course, very welcome. There is an issue around morale, having had months and months of debate over police numbers, for example, and officers are feeling uh, under some pressure. The November statement was welcome, but we now have this position where there will be more money going into uh, armed officers, so what does that mean for other officers within the Met and PCSOs in particular? And in Southwark, we've lost 200 police officers and PCSOs since 2010 already, so there is a concern we might lose more of our uh, general police force. Yeah, what, what's the answer to that, do you think? Have you got any kind of reassurance that if you're going to put more cash into the armed element, that you're going to take that away from what neighbourhood policing or something else? Well the government is providing some more money, an extra 34 million I understand um, and recently I did have a meeting with uh, the Commissioner and we discussed these kind of issues and he's laid out steps that he's introduced to actually look at where he can find additional resources through uh, looking at the police estate for example, reducing back office costs. Um, but I have to say I do agree with Neil particularly that uh, we remain a viable terrorist threat in this country. We've seen attacks most recently not only in Paris but also in Indonesia this week. And so I certainly welcome not only the additional officers but as you say the armed response vehicles who will be able to uh, actually react in uh, an instance or an occasion when uh, an instance occurs, usually at very short notice in a spontaneous occasion. OK, let's um, move on. Um, he wants to mount an all-out assault on poverty, was how the Prime Minister put it this week. And one of the key parts of his strategy is to knock down the hundred or so most unappealing council estates in the country. Several of the candidates for demolition naturally, we imagine, at being here in London. Andrew Cryan has more. Council estates. According to the Prime Minister, too many are magnets for crime, deprivation and mental illness. This week he said he wants the worst hundred in the country to be demolished or completely overhauled. Now, according to David Cameron, there's a link between the architecture of these post-war council estates and the problems that he talks about. He even went as far as quoting a piece of research that said three quarters of people who took part in the London riots of 2011 came from council estates, something which he said was no coincidence. But does architecture really turn people into criminals? Brixton's Angel Town Estate was rebuilt a decade ago, having had serious problems with crime and gangs. I think it would be trouble, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, a maze of tunnels and ramps. Okay. We met up with one former gang member who told us he thought the revamp had made no difference. Let's say everybody, everybody is criminals in these estates. You have to look at it like cockroaches. If you take off, lift up a rock and a cockroach is, runs away from the cockroach, where's the cockroach going to go? The cockroaches doesn't disappear. Do you understand? The cockroaches is a fiber and it will find somewhere else to, to live. Five years ago, the BBC visited another estate around the corner, Myatt's Field, home of Pastor Mimi Asher, who turned her house into a youth centre after her son had become involved with a local gang. The council credited her with turning around the whole estate. But her home has now been demolished. Myersfield 2 is in the process of being knocked down and replaced, even rebranded as the Oval Quarter, where a three-bed house now sells for over £800,000. We met up with Pastor Mimi again, along with her son and another ex-gang member, none of who live on the new estate, but still have strong memories of the old days. For me personally, it was like it was an island, you know. We were kind of segregated from the outside world and it kind of more instilled in that whole notion of the splitting effect of us and them. There was a weird spirit to it, so um, it makes you want to hang around that place pretty much. Um, whereas if you've got these nice houses and stuff, you're not really going to be having a group of young people smoking outside there. But Mimi told us she thinks knocking down bad estates is a good idea. I look at some of the estates and I'm thinking, that no wonder we have such um, issue with gang, some of the estates are really not worth living in. 
And many times I, I, I've walked in some of the estate and I feel really depressed. And I thought, I mean, no one really should live here. So I do 100% agree that a lot of those flats needs to be pulled down. But some people wonder whether the government is really ready to put its money where its mouth is. Now, David Cameron has pledged £140 million to do 100 estates around the country. But to put that in perspective, the bill for this one single estate in South London, well, that was exactly the same amount of money. The cash from the government is intended to be seed money. The rest will come from the private sector and pension funds have been mentioned as one possible source. But according to Anne Power, a professor at the London School of Economics and expert in housing estates, the cash will be spread very thin. And then you're talking about the planning process, the consultation process, and the smoothing of the whole 10-year development, the creation of special vehicles, the involvement of professional experts. I just can't imagine, having worked on lots and lots of difficult estates, that that would come near. As yet, the government hasn't said which estates they intend to knock down. News of that and the funding is due in the autumn. And, of course, uh, we'll uh, wait for that detail. That detail will be important. I'm sure there will be lots of people who will have their own favourites um, who want to see that happen. But th this point about it being, is it architecture? Is it the building or is it the people who live in it that's the problem, Matthew? Well, in my constituency, I've got a couple of estates that are similar to the one shown in your film, particularly uh, the West Hendon estate, which Barnet Council and the Mayor and indeed the government have been regenerating and we're rebuilding that and that is becoming a success story in itself. We've also had other locations such as the Stonegrove estate that's been transformed by the work that's, that's taken place. So what's new about this then? What's he, what's he saying that's any different? Because it has been going, we all know this regeneration, Neil will be able to tell us in a minute about Haygate and Aylesbury no doubt. You know? Well indeed, but we had a, the Graham Park estate that was built just after the war, uh, which I've taken both Ian Duncan Smith and indeed the Chancellor to, so I hope that's had some effect upon government thinking. But these estates are very much places that are no ghost places at night. The police say it's very difficult for them to, to monitor and to uh, enforce the law in those areas. So the walkway issue normally or whatever, it escape routes. Or so I do think it's the physical attributes of, of these places that are a problem and in turn that has a knock-on effect upon people's perceptions of those that live in those areas. Um, Neil, uh, what did you think about this? Because David Cameron also took the opportunity to almost come and attack uh, Jeremy Corbyn from the left, some people thought, that he was kind of being conservative, leaving people where they were in, in these you know, properties that weren't that great. Yeah, I thought the, uh, you know, instead of answering the substantive questions that Jeremy Corbyn was uh, asking, the Prime Minister chose to make some cheap political digs, which is unfortunate when we're talking about people's homes. And the context here is five years of ignoring the housing crisis. We've had home ownership drop, we've had an 83% cuts to the Homes and Communities Agency budget. Councils like my own have been doing what they're doing on estate regeneration, despite the government taking millions of pounds out of uh, the coffers to, to, to build more homes. And we've seen just, just in in this parliament, the start of this Conservative government, um, housing associations and councils who are losing millions of pounds, Southwark councils losing £65 million under uh, the social rent reduction. So to turn up with a million pounds for one estate somewhere in Southwark is, is it doesn't even replace the money that the government have taken away. It's, 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 some of the language is also, I think, deeply damaging. You're, you're telling people they shouldn't live in areas where actually many people have no choice and many people actually enjoy living. So there are, there are other concerns I have about how some of this debate is going forward. Matthew. Plus, we, we do not have the level of detail that's needed. So um, the right, people who have used right to buy are leaseholders on estates, now have no idea whether the government might turn up tomorrow and say and condemn their estate, move them out, and they've got no choice where to, to live after. Matthew, take any issue with that? Yeah, I certainly do. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of points. The first Obviously. is about the, the 140 million being seed capital. We've worked, or my local authority worked very strongly with the, the, uh, the private sector, both Barrett's. Uh, metropolitan housing uh, have, have uh, achieved uh, regeneration. But in addition, the big point and the big issue I think here is about having tenancies for life. People living in properties and some saying, well, they should be able to live there for life. No one has a right, even in the private sector, those of us that own our own properties. You're happy with that, that we're changing tenure to a maximum of five years now. You're happy with yes, that? Yes, I am. We cannot guarantee, even ourselves who have mortgages, that we're going to live in that property for the rest of our lives. This, this idea that that is somehow new to work in partnership, actually, under the last five years, the reason Southwark Labour, Southwark's Labour Council has done so much and has the biggest council house building programme anywhere in the country, 11,000 homes coming, and has built more affordable units in the last five years than any other council in London, is because it's worked in partnership with uh, the private sector. And 
and uh, housing associations to provide some of the homes we, we know we, we need. We know the experience uh, from uh, Southwark is that a Labour uh, authority there is not replacing with like to like. Well, well, this Everything is, another... is more expensive, etc. Well, is... But I don't want to put this point to, oh. to Matthew. Do you accept that you, if you knock down these estates, what you put in, in its place, both in its nature of tenure mm. and the number of properties, mm -hmm. you, we never match what we've lost, which I means mean, people being displaced. I don't think you ever can for the simple reason that using the private sector capital is going to ensure that there is a requirement to sell some of those properties privately. So you're never going to be able to do that. No, let's be realistic th about this. I think it's really important to flag up that actually it, the, the estates we talked about in Southwark specifically, the right to return was there for any resident who wanted to come back. Now many didn't for a mix of reasons, but the right to return was there. The government is not clarifying whether that same uh, policy will be in place under its plans on what it's calling sink estates. But, but when it's getting rid of sink estates or brutalist, you know, architectural <coughs> you know, estates, etc. are they doing it because they want to socially cleanse or socially change areas? No, and I, I find that term socially cleanse quite offensive, actually. Um, we're actually trying to socially improve people's lives, not only through the quality of their, their housing, but also through their ability to access transport, to, to engage in a work process, and maybe to live in different parts of London they not considered before. OK, let's move on. One of the train services between London and the South Coast was this week branded an appalling joke. One MP said that Tim Peake got to space quicker than she made it to Brighton. And now officials from Southern and Network Rail are going to face an interrogation from local MPs. Fayola Douglas has more. Southern Railways were severely criticised before Christmas after passengers forced major delays because of signal faults. And now Southern Railway bosses could face huge fines over its unsatisfactory and unreliable service if it does not fulfil its promises after a grilling from disgruntled MPs. The operator said services had been hit by infrastructure and train problems and staffing issues. The official watchdog organisation representing the interests of transport users in and around the capital is concerned. For the last 18 months, performance has just got worse and worse and worse. But fundamentally, performance, trains turning up, trains getting to their destination roughly when they're expected to, that has just not, not improved as we expected it should do. Commuters in the South East have also suffered months of disruption because of rebuilding works at London Bridge. By their own admission, they have not had decent rolling stock and enough trains, and they also, at the outset, didn't have enough drivers. Very basic things. Provide drivers, provide trains. That's what you're supposed to do under your agreement, and then they have failed to do that. I really do think the time has come for ministers to act. We've had enough of the excuses from their executives. Southern Railway told us... Our punctuality performance is not what our passengers expect or deserve, and we apologise for this. Great investment is being made which will ultimately deliver more capacity and more reliable services through new and longer trains, untangled routes and new technology. With mounting concerns over Southern Railway's performance, pressure is building to find a different solution to rail travel in South East London. Well, Sam Sims is here from the uh, Centre for London, uh, who's written a report uh, recently on transport, but recommending in particular that TfL take over a lot more of these suburban. Just outline what you're recommending. So we're proposing that suburban services in South London, those terminating just inside or just outside the London boundary, be uh, devolved from the management of uh, the Department for Transport down to Transport for London, and that will allow Transport for London to invest in them as they have in North East and West London already in order to improve frequency, in, improve capacity and improve customer experience. Would that include something like Southern Railways route coming up from Brighton? It would include some of it would include services running on some of those train lines but it would only right. be suburban services so if you get on the train in Brighton this wouldn't affect you. So it has to be what services what from something like Croydon or East Croydon into town or whatever that could do. Exactly. Is that practical when many of those services are, are ones that do start in Brighton or wherever else? Whatever. Um, yes, it is practical. Although they share the same lines, you can split the services quite easily. And in the past, when we've had rail reform, we've chopped and changed that. And why would you do it? I think whenever we're talking about uh, reorganising public services, it's important to start with what consumers want. And we've seen from that video that there's quite a bit of dissatisfaction at the moment. It costs billions though, doesn't it? I mean, it would cost billions to do it. It costs billions, but let me just make the case first. So many of the lines in North East and West London were previously run, managed by the Department for Transport, run by private companies. When the overground was created there with the orange branding, the orange line, Transport for London invested in those services, bought new trains, upgraded the platforms, and it's gone from being one of the least popular services in London 
to the most popular um, amongst the South London serving franchises. But is there any evidence that, that, that the public would want this? I mean, some people see it as kind of TfL, a kind of, you know, land grab, every expanding empire, etc. Do people want this if they're living out just outside or on the outskirts of London, this to happen? I think they do want it, yes. And um, if you look at what the passenger representative groups from those areas are saying, they're broadly supportive because they've seen what it's done in North London, where passenger numbers have increased 80% just in the four years after this line was created. This service is popular with consumers because it runs more frequently and there's better passenger information on the platforms and so on. Um, Neil Coyle, London Bridge being in your, um, in your patch here, um, we should say, really, on Southern Railway's behalf, you know, one of the reasons why they've had to, they've got to divert some of their services is because of all the improvements, all the stuff being done at, um, uh, at London Bridge. Network Rail are a problem here as well, aren't they? Network Rail are a problem, but I do think there are specific issues around and Southern in particular. I mean, there was, there was a train this week delayed because of the wrong kind of sunlight shining so that the driver couldn't see signals. That is totally unacceptable. Commuters deserve better. London deserves better, actually. There's, there's huge problems for the London economy of getting this wrong. And I'm really pleased that Sadiq Khan, who's our uh, Labour candidate for London Mayor, would be a fantastic candidate, has already uh, endorsed your proposals and is, is calling for TfL to have a greater control of the franchise. But in their defence, again, you know, they have in the last couple of years or whatever, there's been a great increase in demand. They have increased by, what, 30%? They've had an increase in demand from passengers in the last couple of years on, on their services. And then yours, Matthew, Thameslink mm. running down, 40% increase in mm. demand for those. It takes time, doesn't it? Well, it does, and, and it's already been pointed out that the redevelopment that's going on on London Bridge, and while I'm not here to defend the train services, I have to say that there will be some disruption in the short term. And, and we will see greater improvements as we have longer trains, more frequency of train, trains in my part of London in, on the Thames link uh, north of, of the Thames uh, and indeed we will have 24 throughput trains through London Bridge when this process is completed. But I do have to say as well, I do agree with Neil, that this process should have been managed. Uh, Thameslink Govey in the north, in, on my side of the river, have been better at managing it and Southern Trains should have, have taken this into account when they uh, decided to go for the franchise. Would you approve of a, of a, of a greatly expanded though, would you approve of Sam's idea here of TfL taking control of all those suburban rail services? It makes sense in terms of integration, doesn't it? No, I don't. Oh. I think TfL, uh, as you say, they're trying to claw more and more services in. I think it, the services would become disjointed. Uh, if we had two different providers on the same line, I think that when there was a, a problem with one part of the line, someone would be blaming someone else in a different organisation, and I don't think it's the right thing to do. But that hasn't happened, and in North, East and West London, we've already got TfL running these services. Um, the usership is up, the number of people using the service, satisfaction is the highest amongst the London serving franchises. And that's not just the overground link route, it's some other offshoot routes as well, isn't it? Yes, there's several lines, separate lines. And that's working? But what I would, I would uh, say to that is that I don't think passengers care who runs the railways, mm. as long as they run them on time properly and at a price But this is exactly the point I'm making, Matthew, now. that they're more happy with mm. these services than but they are with the ones in South London no. at the moment. And, it, and it's not happening right now, they're not getting the service that, that the community needs, but, but also the Department of Transport hasn't been managing this properly. We've got massive population growth coming in London, particularly in Birmingham or Southwark, another, another something like 30,000 over the next 10 years. Um, without TfL having more say in that, I would welcome TfL having more say in that, but I would also welcome a mayor having more oversight of TfL. And there are other problems with TfL, in particular around the elephant, but okay. that's for a, a, another, another conversation. Another day. Um, must end it there. Sam, thanks very much indeed uh, for coming in. Now for the rest of the uh, news in 60 seconds. Junior doctors went on strike in London and across the country this week. The dispute is over weekend working, career progression and safeguards to protect doctors from being overworked. A further 48-hour walkout will start on the 26th of January, if no agreement is found. According to Kevin Hurley, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Surrey and the former lead on counter-terrorism at the City of London Police, the so-called jungle camp in Calais may be a refuge for returning jihadis before smuggling themselves into the UK and the capital. London underground staff are to stage three 24-hour strikes over pay and the night tube. The strikes by the RMT, ASLEF and Unite Union members will start on the evenings of the 26th of January, the 15th of February and the 17th of February. London Underground has offered a four-year pay deal over the issue and said it would hire part-time drivers to staff an all-night service at weekends.
possibility as we um, uh, uh, see there of further strike action, doctors and tube workers out on the same time on, on the same day. Neil, um, do you condemn the the, the the tube strikes that are coming down the line? No, not at all. Um, there is a really unfortunate trend under this government that we've had judges go on strike for the first time in history, junior doctors go on strike for the first time in 40 years, and we have a, a Tory mayor in London who in eight years hasn't even bothered to meet with the trade unions in London. That is no way to negotiate, that is no way to run a transport system, it's no way to support the London economy. So you think they're absolutely right to with, withhold their um, labour? If, if uh, you know, if, if their work conditions have been changed so dramatically that, that, that they feel that they have... Well, no, have no they one, been? No, have one, they been? no one wants to go on strike. Let's have, they been, have they been changed sufficiently to go on strike? But no one wants to go on strike and lose income. That is that when that happens, something has really fundamentally broken down and I wish the government would have more respect for ACAS as a, as a means of resolving the whole range of disputes. Industrial unrest in your capital, Matthew. I had a very long conversation only this morning with staff at my local tube station and they told me there is no appetite for a strike at all and this is being pushed by the unions and it's politically motivated, they just don't want this to happen um, and some of the unions, the TSS, has said there's not going to be an all-night tube service. They just don't want it, that's it. So they're using this as an excuse just to beat the government because the government that was elected in May wasn't the one that they wanted. Do you think um, a service like this should be introduced without real safeguards on, you know, hours and number of shifts you work, etc., and the sociability, the quality of life issues? If you're talking about the tube, of course, yes, I do. Um, but there's no uh, any kind of indication that that won't happen anyway. In regards to the junior doctors, uh, I think there's enough safeguards that have already been introduced that will address those issues. What about Neil's point that um, uh, this mayor has not spent time um, uh, uh, meeting the unions? And interestingly, your new candidate, Zach Goldsmith, says that he should be more involved, not in the nitty-gritty of negotiations, mm -hmm. but he should be meeting both sides. Which one do you agree with? Well, I have to say, you do delegate things. And in terms of the current mayor, Boris Johnson, no doubt he has delegated that to people who work with him on on his behalf. It's not as though he has to attend every single meeting about every different issue. But what about just attending one? Yeah. Well, perhaps he perhaps he was being it, busy protecting London through truth, other areas. The truth is, he's checked out already. He's too busy writing for the Telegraph and doing his other jobs instead of focusing on London. Ken Livingstone was very, very careful about not getting involved in the nitty gritty as well. He needed to go and say, "I'm not with you guys, you union or time." But he did meet with them occasionally. It doesn't have to be on the on the on the, the minutiae. But we've seen a doubling of strikes under Boris in City Hall. That is not a coincidence. He just does not have time to negotiate and actually uh, meet with those whose lives and, and work conditions are being. Changed. The big, big, big difference between Ken Livingstone and, and Boris Johnson is that Ken Livingstone will certainly be holding to the unions. And indeed, as uh, Neil yourself, you actually received a donation from the unions. Uh, oh, we're going into pay. areas no and, time and for such detail. Certainly, exactly. Thanks very much indeed, Andrew. Back to you.